I thank everyone for coming. We're really excited to have Ryan here with us tonight. Um, Ryan is a great writer on the... Uh, <laughs> um, he's been writing about uh, the economy and the future of the economy for several years now, and we're really excited uh, about some of his recent articles. Um, Ryan is a senior editor, editor and columnist at The Economist and the author of The Wealth of Humans. Um, and we are really excited to have him with us today. So um, can we give Ryan a hand and a welcome? <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you all very much for, for coming this evening. I guess the, the rain has lit up, so it's not quite so painful to get here. So uh, it's good to be at the School of Visual Arts. I, as I was putting my slides together for this, I was very self-conscious about my fonts. I <laughs> uh, don't usually have this kind of audience, so. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's good to be here in New York, and um, is it weird to be in New York with, under the new administration with the family living up in, in Trump Tower? Um, I, I've lived in Washington for ages, and uh, there's like a long, uh, proud history of people moving from New York to Washington uh, and then complaining about everything. But usually it's stuff like pizza and bagels rather than like the deep state. So this is, this is a, new, a new thing for us. Um, but I guess to start off with, I think the politics of the moment does provide a, a, some important context uh, when we're talking about what's going on with technology uh, and with work in, in the economy. And uh, it, you know, Donald Trump uh, is a very different kind of politician, with practicing a very different kind of politics than what uh, we've seen in the United States over the last, well, uh, I'm not sure when we've last seen uh, politics quite like this. Um, but he's not an isolated example. If we look uh, in, in Latin America, if we look in Europe, um, we see a lot of places in which politics seems to be taking sort of a radical turn. And um, I think this is, this is an interesting thing uh, for a lot of us because uh, for the most part, over the last 20 or, or 30 years, we haven't really seen that kind of thing. Politics, at least in the rich world, has been pretty boring. And, uh, I think the way to think about that is, is uh, in terms of, of, of how politics helps us decide what we want to do with all the other things in society, including technology. And when we think about technology, you know, it, as economists, we, we approach it in a very kind of boring way. We say you take some technology, you mix it with a little bit of labor and a little bit of capital, and you produce stuff. And then when the technology gets better, you can produce more stuff, and that's kind of how it works. Um, but in fact, the process is much more complicated. And when, you, when people come up with a new technology, it creates uh, possibilities. And then as we realize those possibilities as a society, we, we do it in a lot of ways by molding ourselves as a society around the technology. So if you think about the car, we didn't just swap out cars, swap out horses uh, and buggies for cars. We restructured the way society works and where people live and how they get around. Um, and the thing is, when society starts to transform itself like that around new technologies, all the sort of old bargains uh, across society, all the different things we sort of understood and, and took for granted, uh, don't work like they used to do. People start to feel that the new uh, bargain that they received is unfair. Uh, they start to, to uh, lament the loss of status that they have relative to other people. Um, and they become unhappy. And if they become unhappy enough, they vote for people who uh, are promising a, a radical change. And sometimes a radical change is a good change, uh, sometimes it's a very bad change, and then other people get unhappy and vote for radical change. And, and really, if we think about the Industrial Revolution up through the 1960s, this, across uh, a lot of the world, was how things went. And it was very messy, and we were constantly having to adjust the bargains we made with each other as, uh, in society in order to, to make technology work for all of us. Uh, and then it didn't really work like that from kind of the 70s and 80s and 90s. We were all just kind of you know, things are more, more placid, uh, and now that's gone away. And so I think when a lot of people look at kind of the, the elections that we've seen over the last few years and that seem a little worrying, they say, well, you know, this is kind of the hangover from the Great Recession, and, and hopefully this will sort of pass. And I think if we think we're entering a new and, and uh, transformative technological age, and that's kind of my perspective, um, then we shouldn't expect it to pass. We should expect things to get, uh, get, get a little bit messy. Um, so. I keep saying technology. When I say technology, what do I mean? Um, and I, a lot of the discussion in, in the popular press now about what's going on with employment focuses on robots. Are robots taking our jobs? Are they going to be 
um, you know, uh, displacing lots of people in, in, in all sorts of settings. And robots are part of, of what's going on, but only one, one small part. And when I look back over the last 30 years, the period over which these stresses have begun to build, uh, I, I think that what we're mostly talking about is the digital revolution in terms of uh, new communication technologies, computing becoming more powerful. And these new technologies have affected uh, the economy in a few different ways. Uh, they have made uh, some highly skilled workers much more productive. Uh, so if you are a, a highly skilled fund manager, you can manage a lot more money for a lot more people than you used to be able to. Uh, if you're a skilled designer, you can um, do a lot more work for a lot more people and, and, and you have many more tools available to you than you did in the past. Um, that's one thing that's going on. A second thing is globalization. And I think a lot of people don't think of this as being kind of a technological uh, effect. But uh, new information technologies allowed firms to outsource work, to set up call centers in different countries and, and take advantage of, of opportunities there. Uh, without these technologies, companies like Apple wouldn't be able to source products from all over uh, Asia, bring them together in a factory in China to, uh, for assembly, and then sell them to consumers all over the world. Uh, they need technology to be able to track that process step by step, to monitor everything, uh, and then to track sales across the economy. And so it was this sort of technology that allowed these uh, supply chains uh, that drove the wave of globalization we saw over the last 15 to 20 years to really uh, emerge. And, and that, in turn, led to hundreds uh, of millions of workers in, in you know, mostly in emerging markets, being brought into uh, the, the world labor market. Uh, and then the third thing is, is automation. And uh, you know, there was a wave of industrial automation that took place in the 80s and 90s. Um, and there's been, there was you know, additional sort of source of automation that appeared uh, later than that. But it's really beginning to pick up a new momentum and some of that is robotics that are you know, more capable, more dexterous than ever, and that can do tasks in, in things like medicine uh, and elsewhere. Uh, but then a lot of it is, is other things. It's the, the application of, of things like machine intelligence to, uh, to new problems. And so what is the, what's the effect of all this? And in my pers perspective, and sort of the thing I focus on in, in The Wealth of Humans, what all of this does that is so disruptive is it changes the status of labor in an economy. And in particular, it makes it so there is an abundance of labor. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, it, it means for one thing that um, there are a lot of workers out there competing for work. And when you have more of something, generally that places downward pressure on the price, so that places downward pressure on wages. Uh, but also, all these different things that I'm describing that technology can do uh, tend to weaken worker bargaining power. They give companies many more ways to get around workers who are demanding uh, more, uh, you know, more pay or you know, more time off. Uh, and so they have the effect of, of squeezing the role of labor in the economy. Uh, and that, I think, is, is, is a big factor behind um, not just the economic trends we've seen, but also the political ones. But it does show up in, in a lot of different economic variables, and, and you may be familiar with, with many of them. One of them is, is the fact that for a large share of the workforce, wages simply have not grown. Uh, very much over the last, certainly since 2000, for some groups uh, since before that. Uh, inequality is, is, uh, is, has risen quite a bit over the last 30 years, um, particularly in, in Anglo economies, but, but also to some extent everywhere. And then the thing I think is really most interesting and most telling is that what we call the labor share of income. This is the amount of income that society generates that goes to people in, in, in wages and salaries rather than people who own stocks or who own land. That has been declining, and it's been declining in rich countries and in poor countries. It's been declining in countries that specialize in manufacturing, as well as countries that focus on services. Um, it's really almost a universal thing, uh, and that, that sort of speaks to the extent to which new technology is, is squeezing labor. Um, and I think this is going to get worse, and um, I think it's going to get worse because of the nature of machine intelligence. And machine intelligence is what we would call a general purpose technology, like electricity. It's something that can be used in many different uh, parts of the economy to do many different sorts of things. Uh, and that alone is sort of interesting, but what's also happening is that it, it seems to be becoming uh, more powerful, more capable, more quickly than we thought. So if you go back to the mid-2000s, you know, people who were thinking about uh, driverless cars and whether software could be made to do that, 
um, were pretty convinced that this was the kind of hard problem that was going to take decades and decades to solve. And, uh, and now we are in a place where, um, where you know, driverless cars aren't perfect, um, you know, neither are human drivers. Uh, and and they're, they're, uh, they're able to be out on roads and functioning uh, much sooner than we had thought. It's also true with speech recognition and, and translation abilities. Um, have improved much more dramatically uh, than, than people had anticipated they would over such a short span of time. Uh, last fall, Google rolled out a new uh, sort of deep learning based, machine intelligence based technique for instant translation uh, to replace its old, uh, its old system, which was much more kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of throw a lot of uh, computing power at it sort of system. And uh, overnight, it improved by, uh, improved tenfold. And, um, it really is stunning now when you go and, and, and click on a new article in Chrome uh, that's in a foreign language, how good the translation is. Um, and, uh, and these other things uh, are, are able to be applied in lots of different settings. It's amazing if you sit down and think about how many of the jobs that, that people have, uh, really at the heart of them, it's about communication between people and sort of just understanding all the little idioms in language and, and, and kind of what, they, you know, what we think they mean because we're able to empathize. If computers can do that, that sort of changes the, the game in a lot of ways for, uh, for a lot of different people. Uh, and so I think that uh, you know, there are studies that sort of estimate how much uh, automation we should expect over the next uh, few decades. And I, you know, some of them say as many as 47% of jobs could be computerized over the next few decades. Some put their number quite lower. Um, I think the thing to, to note is that it's happening and that you don't actually have to have, you know, 40% of jobs automated to cause huge social and, and economic upheaval. So I, uh, yeah, I studied economic history. And the way I approach a lot of uh, my thinking about what technology is going to do to work, to the economy and society, is, you know, it comes from looking back at what's happened in the past. And, and there's a lot we can learn from industrial history. Um, one thing we can learn, and I've, so far what I've said has been a little gloomy. One thing we can learn, though, is that uh, Technology, uh, particularly technology that um, displaces people from older sorts of jobs, ends up over time making us all much better off. Uh, we are able to stop doing kinds of work that, that aren't very fun. You know, uh, stacking uh, boxes in, an, in a hot Amazon warehouse is not a fun thing to do, and if robots can do that, that's a good thing. Um, and it will also give us many more. You know, what, of what economists would call consumption opportunities, but ways to sort of spend our time you know, that are fun or rewarding or satisfying. And that could be, could be video games, but it could also be programs that allow us to learn or explore new, new subject areas. The consumption possibilities are much improved by technology. Um, and then also, if, if, it's, you know, if we can apply these things in medicine and so on, uh, we may end up being healthier as well. And, and so it's, it's a, a very worrying story so long as we're focused on kind of the role of work in society. And that's very important. But there are good things to go along with it. Uh, to go back to the gloomy bit, um, I think the, the attitude that a lot of people have, and I think people in Silicon Valley are often most guilty of this, uh, is that sure, technology causes displacement. It causes creative destruction. Um, but it also creates new opportunities. And things sort of all work out in the end. And technology solves whatever problem it creates. Uh, and this is, this is a picture, this is a, a, a lithograph, I think, of uh, the Luddites. And, and the Luddites were craft workers, craft textile workers in Britain in the early 19th century who um, were going to be replaced and eventually who were replaced by uh, powered, powered looms, powered equipment. Uh, and their response um, was to do this, to go into the uh, the, uh, the plants and to take a sledgehammer to, to the equipment in an effort to, to save their jobs. And um, there is no happy ending for the Luddites. They, you know, we, we sort of laugh at them and think, weren't they silly to try to resist technology? But actually, their skills became devalued. And in their lifetimes, they didn't, they didn't see new economic opportunities arising. And so that's another lesson from the Industrial Revolution, is that people will lose out. Uh, and the, the new opportunities that arise often take quite a long time to appear. And then the Industrial Revolution teaches us a little bit about what maybe we can do to try to make this process of change less difficult uh, or to solve the, some of the problems that it creates. And uh, one thing that we can do is uh, educate people. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, most people couldn't read or write, had no sort of basic scientific knowledge or engineering knowledge. 
And um, over the course of the 19th and early 20th century, you know, there were broad movements that pushed for public education, uh, you know, universal secondary education, and then for accessible and affordable university education. And that made a huge difference. It meant that we could, we were able to find people to fill these roles, um, and, uh, and also that inequality was not as high as it might have been because we were churning out so many high skill workers. Um, so that's one thing that we can learn. Uh, another is that uh, place matters. In the Industrial Revolution, the places where the new opportunities were being created grew just fantastically quickly. Um, cities appeared out of nowhere. Uh, and that was you know, what the technology of the day sort of demanded. And we see similar pressure today. We see uh, the cities that are at the heart of the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the process of creation of new opportunities, like Silicon Valley and New York and London, um, are growing tremendously in economic terms. Uh, what they're not doing is growing tremendously in population terms. Uh, that is largely because you know, in, the, in the 19th century when a city grew, we just threw up new, new slums, new apartment buildings. Um, it was bad in some ways because those conditions were often poor, but then it also meant that lots of people, including poor people, had access to these growing economies. Uh, and now we don't really do that. We, we make our most prosperous places, our most productive places, unaffordable for a lot of, uh, of, of less skilled workers. And um, so that's a worrying thing. Uh, and then the other way that we adjusted was in changing our social safety net, changing what it meant to work and sort of lowering the stakes of, of work so that it wasn't the case that when you were in work, um, you had to take the risk of losing an arm, uh, you know, while you were completing your, you know, plow or whatever. Uh, and, and that if you then lost your job for whatever reason, you didn't starve to death because there was a social safety net there to support you. Um, and that process was critical to making these technologies uh, work for, for and, and generate benefits for the broad mass uh, of society. And I think we're going to need to do quite a lot of that. Um, Again, now, I think the trick, tricky part is that it's much harder in some ways. With education, for instance, uh, it's much easier to go from a situation where 10% uh, you know, of the population has what you might think of as a secondary education uh, to you know, 70 or 80% than it is to go from 90% of working age people having a secondary education, which is where we're, we are now, roughly, uh, to 99%. And even if you can do that, uh, it doesn't get you nearly as much of a, of a, of a benefit as the, the initial rise did. And even with university education, that's true. And I think it's, it's interesting if you look at the data that um, the premium that graduates earn now uh, has sort of stopped growing. It's still growing for people with advanced degrees, but not for just bachelor's degrees. Uh, and also wage stagnation since 2000 has extended upward to people with college degrees. So I think that the idea that we might educate ourselves out of this mess um, is, is not quite right. Um, there are, you know, potentially we could solve the, the geography problem and make our cities more accessible. Um, potentially we wouldn't, we can come up with ways where that's not necessary by making workplaces more accessible over distances. Uh, and you know, certainly there's a lot of effort to try to do that through different workplace communication tools. Virtual reality is an interesting thing to think about in that context. Maybe it would just be not nearly as important to be in New York if you can you know, essentially attend meetings um, while living somewhere uh, on the other side of the world. And then also there is the, the, the social safety net aspect that is going to have to, to change, uh, but I'll get to that in a moment. But I think when we think about all the new possibilities that are being created, and there are a lot of new possibilities, we have to sort of think about um, what, we, what we want our work life to be like, what roles we want people to fill, what it means to have uh, a quality job and not just any job. And I think there are some encouraging things if you look at the kinds of work now that, that seem to be relatively immune from, uh, from technological automation, uh, they tend to be rewarding high quality jobs. Uh, there are, I, I think, there will continue to be a role for people who are on the frontier of technology, figuring out how to make these things work for people, uh, how to, to, make, uh, to allow people to, to use them well. Um, and that's interesting knowledge-based work. Uh, I think the, we see that People do well in all sorts of professions when they're in roles that require the building of a lot of relationships um, with individuals that, you know, the, the role of a lawyer uh, who, who just does sort of basic transactional law uh, is very much threatened. But a lawyer who builds relationships with clients and can help them answer bigger strategic questions about what they're trying to accomplish and why uh, is safe. And um, 
law maybe is not the most sort of uh, you know, socially uh, exciting example there, but I think in a lot of different roles, relationships uh, will continue to matter. And then we sort of joke about it, but I think the artisanal economy is important and will continue to be more and more important. Um, people value some things simply because they were produced by a human and not by a machine. That's intrinsic to the value of it. Uh, and it's not just kind of you know, artisanal chocolate bars or avocado ice cream or, or whatever. It's, um, I, th I like the example, I'm from Raleigh in North Carolina, which um, in North Carolina is, used to be mostly an agricultural state. Now the Research Triangle has kind of a nice uh, tech economy there. And as it's grown up and gotten richer, uh, the tastes in pe for pe that people have in local restaurants have sort of become more sophisticated. And so a lot of the farmers around uh, Raleigh who used to kind of produce industrial, you know, agricultural goods um, have now started to specialize in, in you know, we're going to do it organic, we're going to do it in a very sort of uh, handcrafted way and sell it to top restaurants. And it's more fun for them. Um, they earn more money and it creates these nice products on the table for, for people eating, rest, uh, eating dinner in Raleigh. So those things are all, um, you know, if we sort of try to imagine the nice way this all works out, that's a key part of it. But I also think there's, there are lots of decisions that society has to make to get back to the point that society bends around these new technologies and reshapes itself around these two new technologies. We have to figure out what we want a job to look like, we have to figure out how easy we want it to be for someone to leave work for a period of time, either to care for uh, someone in their family or to go back to school. Um, we have to figure out what we want to do with education. Uh, do we want to continue to, uh, to uh, double down on the system that we have or, or do we want to encourage accreditation of online universities so these things are more accessible? Uh, we have to figure out how much redistribution we want to do. If, if we were able to do a lot more redistribution through a university, universal basic income, that might open many new opportunities for different kinds of work, sort of what I call a semi-professional work, uh, where you are doing something that can't earn you enough money to support yourself. But since you're earning a, a basic income, you don't have to support yourself. You just have to sort of cover your costs. And so you can have a small business where um, you, know, you cover your costs, people sort of enjoy what you've got. You couldn't live off of it, but you don't have to. Uh, or you can sell crafts can live off of it, uh, you can, couldn't live off of it, but you don't have to because you've got this, this universal basic income. Uh, and so I think stepping back, the big takeaway that we all ought to have is not that, is, is rather that, that technology is not going to solve these problems all on its own. That there is a, a, a process that has to take place in which we as a society decide what we want work to look like, what role we want it to play in society, what we want the rewards to be for doing that sort of work, and, and what we want the rewards to be for those who, for whatever reason, are unable or uh, unwilling to do that sort of work. And uh, I guess to close, I would just say that this can be a very messy process, and there's no getting around the fact that uh, <coughs> that, that sort of you know, interesting political era from the late 18th century to the 1960s um, was, uh, was a very rocky one and, and, uh, and, and a very nasty one in some ways. Um, and the hope would be that we learn from that and that we have new institutions now that, that make us stronger as a society and more able to deal with change, uh, that we have past experience and say, you know, we, the world wars were a bad idea and we, we really shouldn't do that again. Um, but I do think we need to be aware that, in my view, that um, that, that kind of political uh, change is possible, that we're, we haven't outgrown it, uh, and that the way to make, keep it from getting worse is to be very active and, and very um, purposeful in trying to, to build the economy and the society that we want. I'll stop there, and I would love to hear what questions you guys have. Yeah, we'll start with a couple questions. Um, do you guys want to, I want to welcome you guys to sit down if you want to sit down. Um, so. Uh, I guess the first question is, um, what in your mind, what are the opportunities for designers to kind of play a role in the future economy um, as, uh, like, as agents of either uh, advancement or possibly agents of like holding back progress? Holding back progress. I don't know if you see like <laughs> any if there's conflict. Like if or there's bad UX design. Then yeah. It's, I, I keep pressing the wrong button. <laughs> um, 
I mean, design is going to be critical for all of this. Um, and uh, it, in so many ways, it's hard to sort of think about. I mean, there are new, sort of looking at the consumption side, uh, there are all sorts of new opportunities to create things that people enjoy doing uh, that will allow them to fill the time they have where they, they may not be working. Uh, I, just, I just wrote a piece not long ago uh, looking at video games and um, how, uh, how much better video games have gotten over the last 20 years and what effect that might be having on people who are, are, are not working. Um, and, and so there are those sorts of aspects. Um, I think you know, design has a role to play in uh, figuring out how to prepare people for, uh, for new jobs in, in the learning process, in the educational process. Um, more and more people are going to be getting their education online. Uh, it's important to think about how the material is presented to them, you know, what the environment is like to keep them coming back if they're not going to have a lecturer there who's forcing them to do things. So that's another thing. Um, I mean, in our new automated world, um, design is everywhere. There's a, I, didn't, I don't know if they have it here. Eatsy, do you have this restaurant, Eatsy? There's, there's an Eatsy in D.C. now, and it's this, you, you walk in and there are tablets there and you place your order, and then there's a wall that's full of little compartments, and Eventually, one of the compartments, they have screens on the front. It's not here, this is a chalkboard, but you can imagine. Um, they have screens on the front, and your name comes up, and it says your order's ready, and you go in and you pick it up, and you don't see humans. And you're left to speculate whether there are also robots in the kitchen producing what you're ordering. But this is, it, it, you know, it's the sort of thing that you, know, you can tell designers spend a lot of time working on every aspect of this. Um, you know, in terms of accessibility, there are a lot of issues. How, how easy is it going to be to use what are increasingly complex um, technologies? Uh, I think the, I mean, it's hard to think of, of areas where it's not, not relevant. Um, in terms of what might set it back, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I think it's more, you know, technology is going to be, we sort of see this with, with Apple and the iPhone, that the way new products are greeted has a lot to do with how they're presented to people, or the way new, Ways of doing things uh, are, are greeted has a lot to do with how they feel and look to people. Uh, you know, Google Glass, people hated, and partly it was because it seemed like kind of they didn't want a camera on themselves all the time. But also, it just was a clunky, weird piece of technology. And um, if it had been better designed and, and more fun, I hope no one here worked on Google Glass. I, I, I realize that run that risk. Um, but no, I think it's um, I think it's hugely important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess. Um, you mentioned the Industrial Revolution and how uh, a lot of people struggled to, uh, as their jobs and skills were no longer valued. Um, so in my mind, that seems like an example of, of poor design uh, in the way that those were rolled out. So I'm curious, like, in, in, as we see these new technologies unfolding, like you're saying, Google Glass, um, how do you see, or like AR, augmented reality, or, or virtual reality, um, how do you think that designers should think about presenting those mediums to new people? It's a good, it's a good question. I mean, there will be, so the, the way things worked out in the Industrial Re Revolution was that you had powerful new technologies, but they were for the most part complementary to people. They needed people to work, to control them. And so once people were able to sort of unionize and demand their share of, of the gains, they, everything kind of worked out all right. And the reason this time might be harder to manage is there's more substitution of machines for workers. Um, but it doesn't have to be that way necessarily. And so, you know, there's this, uh, this slide here of, of this, this fellow who's all teched up. Like, um, you know, there is plenty of, uh, of opportunity to create new technologies um, that allow people to work with these machines. Augmented reality is, is one example of that that people are working with. Um, to try to allow people of modest skill levels to be much more productive and much more effective and, and keep their place uh, in the workforce. Um, also, there are, uh, I think I just read that Amazon is looking to broaden its uh, distance employment to hire a lot of new workers who aren't located, you know, you know, not located in Seattle, not located in any of the log logistics warehouses, but who do work from home through these portals that Amazon is, is designing. And, uh, you know, there will be lots of ways that creative people can work to try to, uh, to, to help people with, with you know, w skills that are threatened by robots to contribute, continue to contribute um, to society and to the economy. 
And it's hard to imagine what those would be. I guess that's your job. Um, but I think, I think that's, you know, those opportunities are there. Um, and then, like, in that mindset, what, I guess, what can we as designers think in mind to design for better outcomes for, um, for all or for more people instead of just the, the top or upper class? Well, it's, I think it's tricky. I mean, I think a lot of the reason that these things, uh, that the benefits of change tend to flow to the top uh, is the nature of the work. And the work is such uh, that it, it requires a few people who are very skilled, kind of pooling their knowledge, working together to generate something that's very valuable. And then once it's created, it can be rolled out to lots and lots of different people. So you design something wonderful like the iPhone, you can sell a gazillion iPhones. Um, and then all that profit goes to the small team. That, so in a way, the, the fact that so much of what we do now, so much of the value associated with it is about the knowledge that goes into creating it, sort of means that this is inevitable in, in, in some sense. So to the extent that that's true, what designers have to do is you know, organize and vote for more redistributive pro, uh, uh, policies and things like that. Um, but I don't think that's it. I mean, I, I think it, there is room for people who are working in these areas to sort of consciously try to develop uh, products that are um, going to enhance the bargaining power uh, of individual workers. If you think about something like Uber, um, that's a company that where a co-op model might easily have worked rather than kind of the, the top-down model. And um, there was room for someone to, you know, create the, um, the you know, it, the engineering platform, but also the, 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 you know, the design that's involved to, to have a system where people could very easily buy into it on their own. The drivers could buy into it on their own and, and, and join together to, to make the company rather than having it um, all be controlled by uh, Travis and his, his bunch. So, you know, I think it's, there are opportunities for people to be conscious of those things. I, I don't know, I suspect the pressure, and I don't, I don't work in the field, but I suspect the pressure is quite often to be, you know, very profit-minded and, and cold-blooded, but it doesn't have to be like that, you know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of people, at least in this program, that are thinking on a societal level, too. That's good. Um, and kind of how we can make positive impacts as well as, obviously, bottom line impacts, but, um, I guess the other, the other thing I'd say is that, you know, I think it's inevitable that we're, that most people will be doing less work. Mm -hmm. um, and to some extent that's simply true because of demographics, right? There are a lot more people um, retiring, having long periods of retirement. It may also be true because of these workplace changes. Um, and, but the upshot is that you have a lot of people who are not in work, but who have a lot of spare time. And if we can find ways to uh, help those people contribute in a way that's good for them and good for society, um, that would be a great thing. And you know, this, is, this is already something that a lot of people are trying to do with, uh, with people who are in retirement to try to find clever ways to get them to, uh, to work together in community groups or contribute you know, through volunteering. Um, but there, for technology and design, there, there are roles there you can, to build uh, online communities or to find ways in which um, they can contribute to projects that may not earn a big profit, but are helpful to some people. And sort of just trying to find ways to use these underutilized resources um, would be important, I think. Can we give Ryan a round of applause? Um, but I guess to start off with, I think the politics of the moment does provide uh, some important context uh, when we're talking about what's going on with technology uh, and with work in, in the economy. And uh, it, you know, Donald Trump uh, is a very different kind of politician, with practicing a very different kind of politics than what uh, we've seen in the United States over the last, well, uh, I'm not sure when we've last seen uh, politics quite like this. Um, but he's not an isolated example. If we look uh, in, in Latin America, if we look in Europe, um, we see a lot of places in which politics seems to be taking sort of a radical turn. And um, I think this is, this is an interesting thing uh, for a lot of us because uh, for the most part, over the last 20 or, or 30 years, we haven't really seen that kind of thing. Politics, at least in the rich world, has been pretty boring. And uh, I think the way to think about that is, is uh, in terms of, of, of how politics helps us decide what we want to do with all the other things in society, including technology. 
And when we think about technology, you know, it, as economists, we, we approach it in a very kind of boring way. We say you take some technology, you mix it with a little bit of labor and a little bit of capital, and you produce stuff. And then when the technology gets better, you can produce more stuff. And that's kind of how it works. Um, but in fact, the process is much more complicated. I mean, when, you, when people come up with a new technology, it creates uh, possibilities. And then as we realize those possibilities as a society, we, we do it in a lot of ways by molding ourselves as a society around the technology. So if you think about the car, I thank everyone for coming. We're really excited to have Ryan here with us tonight. Um, Ryan is a great writer on the... Uh, <laughs> um, he's been writing about uh, the economy and the future of the economy for several years now, and we're really excited uh, about some of his recent articles. Um, Ryan is a senior editor, editor and columnist at The Economist and the author of The Wealth of Humans. Um, and we are really excited to have him with us today. So um, can we give Ryan a hand and a welcome? <laughs> we didn't just swap out cars, swap out horses uh, and buggies for cars. We restructured the way society works and where people live and how they get around. Um, and the thing is, when society starts to transform itself like that around new technologies, all the sort of old bargains uh, across society, all the different things we sort of understood and, and took for granted uh, don't work like they used to do. People start to feel that the new uh, bargain that they received is unfair. Uh, they start to, to uh, lament the loss of status that they have relative to other people. Um, and they become unhappy. And if they become unhappy enough, they vote for people who uh, are promising a, a radical change. And sometimes a radical change is a good change. Uh, sometimes it's a very bad change, and then other people get unhappy and vote for <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you all very much for, for coming this evening. I guess the, the rain has lit up, so it's not quite so painful to get here. So uh, it's good to be at the School of Visual Arts. I, as I was putting my slides together for this, I was very self-conscious about my fonts. Uh, <laughs> I don't usually have this kind of audience. So, um, But it's, um, it's, it's good to be here in New York. And um, is it weird to be in New York with, under the new administration with the family living up in, in Trump Tower? Um, I, I've lived in Washington for ages, and uh, there's like a long, uh, proud history of people moving from New York to Washington uh, and then complaining about everything. But usually it's stuff like pizza and bagels rather than like the deep state. So this is, this is a, new, a new thing for us.